The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. Well, welcome to The Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta, and I am The Quiet Warrior. I'm excited today to have on the show Valerie Barubi. Valerie, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great. I was trying to figure out in my mind before you came on what the term is in the military for failure to launch. I mean, we we tried to do this a couple times. I was sick, but here we are. So it's going to be an incredible journey. And you're down in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, Valerie, as I mentioned offline, that this show is all about you. So, hey, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I'm a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel with 30 years of service combined active and reserve service. I uh, served in Kosovo and Iraq and Afghanistan and as a company commander at the School of Infantry, which was their uh, Marine Combat Training Battalion. And um, it might sound very impressive, uh, you know, like I achieved all this stuff, um, but as a as a 14-year-old kid, um, I was far from that, uh, far from the the person I just described. I was drinking and smoking and getting into fights and had poor grades and I was no longer a virgin and uh, you would not have been impressed. So uh, I guess the story is how did I get from there to here? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, already they usually say that in the first minute of a show, they say when something powerful happens, we're going to stay till the end. And it's like, wow, you just blew my mind with uh, that opening. And so we're going to let you catch your breath. And <laughs> I'm going mm-hmm. to build you up for, from the bio I read about you, fill in a few more things. Uh, we're honored to have somebody who's from the service on the show. This is a North American audience. I mean, congratulations for taking that journey, the Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel. I mean, yesterday was International Women's Day, and, and you know, there's two trains of thought on celebrating that day. It should be Women's Day every day, but when you find a woman who's gone into leadership to the highest levels in the military, it's really a blessing to learn from you on the show. Also, you've written a couple books. I know you're very humble about it, which which is what I love about you. It's called Polish Your Star. There's two volumes to it. I know we're going to get into that because they're treasures. Uh, and uh, and then the last thing about the book I wrote down was Hip Pocket at Classes. There's many books out there, but these ones you can use daily and it teaches you lessons uh, uh, right in your hip pocket. I think it's going to be something that everybody's going to want to get. I uh, I want to tell the audience that they don't have the benefit of seeing what I see. I see this really astute, wonderful uh, person on a video while I'm in my studio here. And I asked you before coming on the show, Valerie, to send me a blurb about your backstory because the hero's journey is really about what, what happened and how did we get here, even right from birth to the greatness we have today in our life. And you sent me this uh, blurb and then some. And uh, reading it, I was blown away. There's a lot of detail in it. So let's get you back and tell you, uh, tell us about the story. Take us right back to, uh, I read this line here. It says, I was a hot mess in high school. And <laughs> it, it wasn't always that way when you talk about your successful today. All right, take us back where it started. Tell us about your childhood and bring us forward. Yeah, well, so uh, my parents divorced when I was about two years old. Uh, they were teenagers when they married. And so that marriage didn't last long. And uh, um, they all, they both went on to different marriages and Um, my father and stepmother had custody of me and I was about two, three years old and I, I loved my mother and I loved my, my father and stepmother too, but I, I loved my mother and, and I, apparently I cried a lot and I missed her terribly and, and I was punished severely for that. Um, you know, on the outside, they, they seemed like great parents, but inside the house they were you know, pretty, pretty mean, um, you know, with, there was a lot of, uh, physical abuse and emotional abuse and, um, and, uh, neglect. And then on the outside, they seem like, you know, these great people. And I'm like, Oh, I, this is not working so well for me. I, I, I saw that I was not allowed to have feelings. So I learned very early in life. Okay. Having feelings and, and expressing them as a no, no. Um, and then, um, 
I acted out a lot in school. I had poor grades. Uh, I wasn't being helped with that. I was being bullied uh, quite badly with um, taunting and people spitting on me and surrounding me and throwing rocks and tomatoes and shoving me. And, and this went on every day. So I started running home from school uh, in order to avoid them. And um, I visited my mother uh, on one of my weekend visits. And um, she was married to a guy at the time who was a master black belt in Kung Fu. And then uh, he <laughs> heard that I was getting bullied like this. And he said, well, that's not going to happen anymore. So I'm going to teach you how to fight and you're going to stand up for yourself. And wow. to me, that was like, a crazy new concept. Woo, you know, stand up for myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so he did after uh, several weeks of his training and he was pretty tough on me. You know, he, he was, he really toughened me up. And then one day uh, after school, I just like somewhere in me, I decided I'm not running home. I'm just not doing it. And I uh, started walking home and then of course, uh, about four or five of these older kids uh, found me and surrounded me and started taunting me. And uh, so I put my red backpack down and I turned around and I just faced them. And the biggest one came up to me and she shoved me. And within a few seconds, she was on the ground crying. And uh, the others were backing off. And so that was the beginning of my journey of defending myself, you know, putting up for, you know, <laughs> doing wow. that. Well, and, Valerie, I'm going yeah. to just, uh, as I, as I want to just stop you there in the story, let you catch your breath. First of all, we're, we're just so honored to hear you share that part of your story. I mean, I talk about this a lot that one of the traits, and I think it's in your book in, in spades about vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, one of the characteristics of a great leader. And, uh, so I just want to, you know, play back to you a few things the, you know, the story you, you went uh, from a childhood of divorce and you know, you say you loved your mother, that you were punished severely, physically, emotionally, neglected. I mean, wow. I mean, everybody listening to this story who's been through that in their childhood is going to say, thank you, Valerie. That is my story. Now, let me learn from you and let, me, let you give me hope. Then uh, the thing that stood out for me also was about expressing feelings. I mean, you've read my book and this is not about me, but I grew up with a toxic childhood with a, a command and control style alcoholic parent. And I was, you know, taught the same thing, how to express feelings. One of the differences, though, is I was picked on and bullied at school. And I wish I'd known you back then because we probably would have formed a tribe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I didn't stand up for myself. I mean, I didn't, didn't learn that. Uh, later in life, I became an advocate for bullying. And in fact, mm -hmm. I've, I've quoted something in somebody's book on it that I said, learning to stand up for someone else is the beginning of learning to stand up for yourself. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So there was something in you, something innate, a seed, a thread that made you fearless, that made you say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up for myself. Uh, I would even say that it was the beginning of your roots of being a leader. And they say that it, our young lives and experiences are what define us. So take us from that moment. There you were and you, know, you, you, you stood up to the bullies and you used your new gifts and talents. Uh, where did you go from there? Well, from there, I sort of became the bully buster. You know, <laughs> I thought, oh, I kind of like this, you know, because it was like Lord of the Flies out there, you know, <laughs> growing up as a kid in the 70s. And so you probably know it, the teachers and didn't do anything about bullying, you know. And so when I was at school, I thought instead of hiding at recess, I was out on the campus. And uh, when these bullies would try to harm someone else, I would come around. And then I started getting into more fights at school because here I was, you know, sort of the crusader on the campus. And uh, then I'd get sent home because I was doing this. But then um, I got to high school and um, I really liked history and I really liked I, you know, I just really liked the military. And then I really liked the Marines, what they were doing and what they did. It, it, it was kind of like they were the global bully busters. You know, they were out there defending the world against some of the most horrible people. Yeah. And uh, I just, I really liked it. And I was energetic and I was athletic and I thought, you know, this is, this is for me. And then I heard Ronald Reagan say in a speech in the eighties, he said, um, Something like uh, the uh, some people spend a lifetime wondering if they made a difference in this world. The Marines don't have that problem, and I thought, well, that's one less problem to have. I think I'll join the Marine Corps. 
So, yeah, that's, um, yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I, I'll give it back to you in a minute, but a thought came in my mind. You know, I'm going on a journey in all these directions in my head right now. And one of them was about the military. My father was a commanding officer in the Canadian forces. And uh, I grew up actually on a military base in the United Kingdom. That's where I was born. And there are uh, children or youth all over the world that are interested in the military. Some of them don't have that characteristic of uh I would say assertiveness or self confidence as you as you did. So take it take us back into the story now that you're in the military uh, and go forward. But also comment on that that if somebody really wants to get into the military but they're shy or maybe they're not as self assured, is there still hope? Oh, absolutely. I think you know. I think one of the big things that attracted me was that servant leadership approach. Uh, you know, that, that the Marines are definitely servant leaders. It's, it's all about serving others and being the best leader you can be. And, um, but there was a little bit, you know, the, the thread going through it all, because just like in early childhood, the only expression I was allowed to have was either happiness or enthusiasm. And in the Marine Corps, it's kind of the same way where you're not allowed to have negative thoughts or whine or say anything bad. It's only, you know, optimism and enthusiasm and, and, you know, because that's how, and there's something to be said for that. I mean, it can get you through a lot of adversity. Yeah. Um, and then but at the same time, you can take it too far and, and it can, um, you know, I would have rather run to the sound of the guns than to be vulnerable about my feelings in at all. You know, that's, uh, I had the courage to, of course, uh, get into the fights, but I did not have the courage to have uh, talk about my feelings. Yeah. Um, and that kind of um, culminated uh, over time. I mean, I was this empathetic, compassionate servant leader who really put my very best for the people I worked for and for the people uh, who worked under me. I worked very hard for them too. Um, but there came a point after... I was a major in the Marine Corps. I was in Afghanistan. I had been there for about two years. And um, one day I came into the office and I uh, opened up a me another email that I didn't like. It was, you know, some just, a, I don't know. It was just a, a, one of those bothersome emails. And I get, I got hundreds of them every day. Um, and I just, I just shut down. Yeah. I, I just shut down. I couldn't. I couldn't talk. I couldn't think. I just sat there staring at the walls for like two hours. I, I couldn't, I just shut down. And um, I realized it's like I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, it, it was like I just hit a complete wall. And so after a time of going through this, I act, for the first time, I actually went to the doctors and said, you know, I think there's something wrong with me. And they said, you know, you've been, you've been here too long. And, and at that time, I had a parent at home who was dying of cancer. And so I was really worried about her. And um, I uh, had to make a very difficult phone call because I realized I, I wasn't going to be able to, to stay there and lead the way I wanted to. So the most difficult phone call of my life was to call my, um, the commanding officer I was working for. He was back in the States and, uh, I called him, he was a Colonel and, uh, informed him that, you know, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry that I've let you down. I, I can't lead anymore. I, there's something wrong with me. I just can't lead anymore. And he said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a normal human being. You're, <laughs> you have been there way too long. And, and I was getting worried about you. I thought you might you know, have a problem. And I never expected that from him, yeah. you know, because uh, in the Marine Corps, you're not allowed to have feelings. You're always going to be tough. You can't, you know, be vulnerable at all. But then actually it was my filter that was wrong. There, there is a lot of compassion in the Marine Corps and they do care, but my filter was so much towards, Oh, you can't be vulnerable. And, uh, and I realized there's another side of leadership and that's being um, empathetic to yourself. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, we're going to get into your books now in a minute. I want you to just uh, pause and I'm uh, reading something here that was written down from you to me. Uh, I, f I found myself increasingly depleted of empathy, angry, impatient, and reactive. I was not the leader I knew I could be, but did not know how to change. I want to use that as a teaching moment because mm -hmm. first of all, I want to honor you for sharing that part of the story. I mean, I don't know how many CEOs, top leaders would get on an international show and have the courage 
to say, you know what, I hit the wall in this area in my career and then talk about why that's the gift in this story. So I want to make a connection here and see if I can get you to, to help me with it. And that is that they, they say that many people, the past, uh, past experiences or past uh, situations will manifest themselves in present day leadership. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is if I take myself as an example, when I was young, I was always, I was wired, you call it a filter, which was so brilliant, but I was mm-hmm. wired that anytime I came across an assertive person or somebody who reminded me, my, my subconscious brain went, wait a minute, that thing looks like my dad. Yeah. Uh, then I would block it. And it's funny what you said about that, uh, you know, when you, you were paralyzed by that email. I was on a phone call one day where I was a CEO of a company. This goes back about 10 years. And there was a fellow on the board of directors in the U.S. It was a, a company that I ran the Canadian side. And uh, this guy, they had a really hard ass kind of leadership style. He got on the phone with me and I just never forget it. And I remember telling my wife about this, that I literally froze. I became paralyzed because he was doing things that reminded me of, these, these situations that I feared. And I had to go on a long journey to unravel it and became, become charactered, which means developing uh, the way around that. So here you are, and I just want to you know, take, take a couple minutes to, to read off my paper here. You know, happiness to enthusiasm, that's kind of the way of the, the military. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that for subconscious thinking, by the way. Uh, bully buster, all these things. And then you made that big phone call and, and you went into retirement. Wow. So what do, you, what do you do now? Where did you take that and get us into the work that you've done with that experience? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I think the biggest thing I learned from that was that I'm not an object. I'm a human being. And um, we can, when we treat ourselves like objects, when we treat ourselves like machines that don't have feelings, then then um, that's when depression and despair build up and then you kind of play this game. Oh, I'm not, you know, I'm all all gung ho and I'm all happy (laughs) when deep inside you are really, really hurting. Um, And so, uh, so I learned from that. But when I left the Marine Corps, I saw that there was um, a lot of young people don't get the leadership that they deserve and they don't get uh, the training and leadership that they deserve. Uh, in the Marine Corps, I felt uh, right away they taught you, even in boot camp as an 18-year-old, they teach you their 14 leadership tra- traits and their 11 leadership principles. And they they continuously put you through this leadership training from, you know, NCO to sergeant to staff NCO to officers. And then even generals get still get leadership training. You, you would think, oh, you know, they've arrived. Oh, actually, no, they continue to get leadership training. It's continuous. And I, I didn't see any of that in the private sector. When I, when I came out in the private sector, they just don't do that. Yeah. And I thought, you know, maybe – Maybe I can do something about that. So, um, so that's that's what I'm doing next is to try to um, teach the value, or, or rather, share the value of of teaching your youngest, your most junior uh, people uh, leadership and having that leadership culture in your in your organization. Yeah, I think it's awesome. Uh, I've got in front of me here on my desk at the studio the two copies of your books. By the way, they have beautiful covers. Just again, it's uh, Polish Your Star, Volume 1 and 2, Three Minute Daily Lessons to Become an Extraordinary Leader. Wow, what an amazing body of work. And I, and I, I think there's something like seven lessons. The thing I like about this is these, these uh, teachings in your book are set up uh, you call it hip pocket exercises, but you literally can take a few minutes a day to teach yourself leadership lessons. It's packed with great stuff. I highly recommend everybody get it and read it. I've read both of them cover to cover. It'll be on my shelf. And I've been in leadership for 30 years and I learned a lot that I didn't know. Uh, so give us a few nuggets out of those books, anywhere you want to go just to tease people uh, about what you're teaching there. Mm-hmm. Well, you the leadership books can be used not only for individuals, but they're actually tools for leaders. Um, so a leader can take uh, any one of these lessons in the book to uh, huddle their people up and and it's two pages of reading. They read that and, and hey, let's have a little chat about this. Well, what did you learn? Well, this is what it taught me. And, you know, a little 10 to 15 minute discussion 
um, every day or even, you know, a couple times a week, that'll, that'll go a long ways in your organizations done consistently over time. Uh, Cause I think one of the most important thing leaders can do is to help others in their leadership growth journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I have, I have, I've come across people from the military. I mean, I was raised in army brat, as you know, and we go into leadership and we take the rules we learned from the military. Uh, I have to say that I learned command and control style leadership from my father and it, I crashed and burned a bit in my career in the early days till yeah. I figured it out. But, but they, how, how easy it is to apply the teachings you've learned into uh, corporate North America. I think you've had a lot of success with this in your work. Just talk about the parallels and why why you think this this training uh, isn't taught and, and works. I think that corporations think that leadership does it, you know is it's too time consuming or it's too expensive, and that's just not true. It, it's it's time consuming and expensive to not teach leadership. That's yeah. <laughs> that's more of the problem, but they, they got this paradigm stuck in their head and they need to change that paradigm. And the secondly is they, they don't teach leadership until someone is actually in charge. And that's yeah. the worst time, <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't do it when they're in charge. That's too late. You, you got to do that much sooner. And, and, um, and at the end of the day, like the Marine Corps uh, philosophy is everybody is a leader. Um, and they bring the uh, examples of battles like um, in uh, World War II, some of these Pacific Island campaigns. I think there was a battle of Okinawa where uh, the lieutenant was killed and then the sergeant was killed. And pretty soon it was a PFC a private first class leading the rest, leading the men. And so that's, that's their philosophy is that at the end of the day, everyone is a leader and and they expect everyone to step up to the plate at some point. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm just fascinated as you're talking, I'm flipping through the book a little bit here. Uh, I, I used a Kindle reader in a couple of cases and I have pages of notes that I took and I can't cover it all in the show. We'll probably have you back again to go a deep dive. Uh, one of the things I think about is my own simple definition of leadership has always been, you know, the number one job of a leader is to develop or create other leaders. Mm. And uh, I like to say that unless you wake up in the morning and love yourself, yes. you can't be in service to others. Your, yes. your book blew my mind. I mean, for example, part one in your first book is called the brain series. Part two is called the awareness series. Part four is my favorite, the neuroscience series. I think these are, this is where the book is a game changer. We won't go into all of that today, but they, in leadership, I've gone to university and colleges, business schools. Uh, I would say less than 5% of the, the content in those programs covers the important part of leadership, which, which you point out so truly in your book is from the inside out. It's mm-hmm. not about the, the head skills. It's about the heart skills. Mm-hmm. And you rocked it. So tremendous work that you've done with these books. I want to go back to one thing you said, and we'll end up, uh, with a couple of things from you on this. And that is, I think you use the words, the courage, uh, you know, you didn't have the courage. And I want to just say to honor you in the work I've done, and I'm going to use this as a teaching moment. I use personality science and 50% in my world, there's four different types of personalities. 50% of personalities are, are wired at birth to withhold vulnerability, to yeah. not be able to feel uh, with the heart. And so they say that if you develop those skills, you become charactered. And it blew my mind to find out that less than 5% of people actually do the self-work. You call it mm-hmm. self-care as well to become charactered. I want to honor you that you took a lifetime of work in the military, turned it into this gift, but you've done the work. I read it in your book and even talk to you now, it comes out of you, the, the ability to use your heart to connect. So I, I think that you're a great leader. Um, want to honor you with some leadership words here. I write these down as we talk, Valerie. They're not scripted. They just come out of me. The first one is leader. You're a picture of a leader. Two is uh, is fearless. I mean, the bully buster is a new phrase I'm going to put down somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, three is uh, a servant leader. And, and the last one I put down just at the end was character. I mean, you are an example of character. You've developed things that weren't innate in you in your early years. So congratulations. So tell us anything you want as we move to wrap up here, but also I'd like you to tell the audience, where can we get your books and your body of work and connect to you? Well, you can get the books on 
um, you know, at any of your favorite bookstores or um, online services. I also have a website called polishyourstar.com. And um, they can connect with me on Facebook and LinkedIn, pretty easy to find. And I would love to hear from people. Well, I'm, I recommend everybody you get the books or read them from cover to cover and connect with Valerie. And hey, Val, one more tough question for you. What's the name of that dog? <laughs> you have a dog? What's oh, yeah, Tyler. He's my golden retriever. He's a good, he's 15 years old. Oh, well, is there a significance to the name Tyler? No, not really. Um, but uh, a little story about him. He was bred to be a hunting dog and he was returned twice because he wouldn't hunt. Uh, and so he was given to me because his life pur- purpose was to be a pet. And he's a great pet. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Well, what a great way to end up to talking about Tyler, something you love. Uh, mm-hmm. I can see that smile on your face. So, Valerie, thank you for being on the show. Everybody, find the show on iTunes. Give it a rating so we can honor Valerie's, Valerie's body of work. And, uh, hey, find that true passion like you see Valerie did and that purpose in your life and live the life that you deserve and desire. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.kreat.ca